Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we are going to hear about the book To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf and the biography of Virginia Woolf, which is by Louise de Salvo, and it's discussed by Lear Keith and Sheila Jeffries. Um, so thank you so much, Lear and Sheila, over to you. Great. Good morning, everybody. Um, so can we have the first slide? I guess the second, there we go, all right. So why is Virginia Woolf important? She was one of the most innovative writers of the 20th century. She was foundational to modernist literature, um, most especially as an innovator in the use of stream of consciousness and interior monologue, and also in the themes that she addressed. The modernists overthrew the conventions of the Victorian novel by portraying the interior experiences of characters, and that was new. Modernist themes revolved around the subconscious, the passage of time, perception, and especially the impact of war and technology. They had a very conscious sense of a break with the past, especially after the horrors of World War I, which has been called the first industrial war um, because of the level of technology, just the amount of slaughter that was involved was something that had never been seen before. So they had a spirit of questioning how to make sense of this very broken world. And to quote Yeats, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world from his very famous poem. Um, they didn't have a particular politic, they tended to be very left leaning, um, but I would say that that probably summed up sort of the spirit of the thing. So, okay, next slide. Besides her novel, she was also a prolific writer of essays, diaries, letters, and biographies. So we know a lot about what she was thinking and what she was experiencing in her life um, in a way that we don't with other people. Um, she ran Hogarth Press with her husband, Leonard, and they published works by T.S. Eliot, Sigmund Freud, Catherine Mansfield, E.M. Forrester. Her house was the center of the cultural activity of the time, and they were called the Bloomsbury Group. So that was an informal social circle that included artists and intellectuals of left-leaning politics and modernist art. They rejected Victorian constraints on sexuality. And in fact, the majority of the members were either homosexual or bisexual. And she's considered one of the most important novelists of the 20th century. So next slide. So just a sample of her writing. The Voyage Out was her first novel. It was published in 1915. The protagonist is a woman and she's on this epic ocean journey while she also explores her inner life. Wolf asserted boldly that a woman can be the hero of her own life as a worthy protagonist and not as simply background to the exploits of men. So this was a sea change. Um, in 1929, she published A Room of One's Own and that was based on a series of lectures she gave at Cambridge. She wrote about the tremendous difficulties women artists and writers face when trying to lead a creative life. What artists need is a small secure income and a place with guaranteed solitude. And both of these are denied to women. She also discussed the demands for self-sacrifice placed upon women and urged us to kill, quote, the angel in the house in order to live our own lives for our own purposes. Okay, next slide. She wrote about women's experiences under male domination and had a wide ranging critique of all the institutions that reproduced male dominance, particularly her essay, Three Guineas where she also talks about militarism as part of male supremacy. Um, she was also either a lesbian or bisexual. We don't really know, but she was married to Leonard. Um, she had no sexual de desire for him though. And she told him that quite bluntly. Uh, it was the reason that she rejected his first proposal of marriage. She said, I'm simply not physically attracted to you. Um, but she did go on to marry him though. They had what would now be called a quote, open marriage. So they both had relationships with other people, but they stayed married to each other. And all of her relationships were with women. Uh, most famously was Vita Sackville West. So they were lovers for a decade and they remained close friends until the end. Okay, next slide. The, um, this was from the, the diary of Vita. Virginia dislikes the possessiveness and love of domination in men. In fact, she dislikes the quality of masculinity. She says women stimulate her imagination by their grace and their art of life. And then Virginia herself wrote, 
I detest the masculine point of view. I am bored by his heroism, virtue, and honor. I think the best these men can do is not talk about themselves anymore. I don't know who could say that more clearly. <laughs> and she did things like she refused patriarchal honors, the companion of honor, and honorary degrees for Manchester and Liverpool. She simply had no time for men and the kinds of things that they were cooking up. She just didn't want any part of it. So she refused them. Um, okay, next. And Sheila's gonna take over from here. Okay. So I'm gonna be talking about or introducing the uh, Louise de Salvo book, uh, which was written in 1989 and talk about how revolutionary and important it was. Can we have slide eight, please, Joe? So, um, yeah, I think the next slide. Yeah, this was the is the opening sentence of the book, and so it shows what what it was really completely about. Virginia Woolf was a sexually abused child. She was an incest survivor, and the mere fact that that term is used in the very first sentence of the book, incest survivor, shows that the book comes out of a time in the history of feminism in the women's liberation movement. There'd been 10 years of fierce writing and activity and campaigning against the sexual abuse of children. And it's out of that and the language that that uh, campaigning developed that this book was written. Can you take that one down now, please, Jim? So um, as she explains in her book, uh, Virginia Woolf's family life and childhood uh, have been written about historically as idyllic. All, all the writers say how what a wonderful childhood she had. It was apparently the perfect Victorian family in which children are loved and protected. Though, as she makes plain, um, Woolf not only did not uh, hide um, the fact that she and other families, members of her family were viciously sexually abused, as well as emotionally harmed by neglect, but she made this really clear in her diaries and fragments of autobiography in a way that really nobody ever has before. Nonetheless, the vicious abuse that uh, arguably the, the UK's most important female novelist suffered was not known apparently to those who wrote about her. If they did, obviously didn't read the stuff or they just ignored it. I don't think I knew about it really before this book and the book was a bombshell. So the book was a revolution. It states clearly and in detail what Wolf told us and what we should have known or very well about the sexual abuse. It was published in 1989. At that by that time, the women's liberation movement had exhumed the rape of children by men within their families because the whole issue had been buried. And there was a lot of writing going on about it. I say exhumed because at one time, feminists in the late 19th and early 20th century created a campaign against sexual violence against children. And I found this when I was uh, researching a PhD I was doing in the late 70s. And I, be I began a PhD on the rape of children at the time and then discovered there was this extraordinary campaign by feminists that I'd never heard about and nobody else seemed to know about uh, going on in the late 20th, early 20th century. Now, what happened was that um, it, the, uh, the campaign was, uh, well, the whole, all the feminist campaigns around male sexuality at the time were defeated, I argued, by the development of sexology and sex therapy, uh, which said that women had uh, made these things up and uh, that women should actually enjoy sex more and started campaigns of trying to sexualize women. Uh, so there was a huge backlash in the time and very, uh, Freud was very, very significant. The story with Freud is that in his practice, he discovered a large number of women who'd been raped by their fathers and at first took it seriously. He thought this was some terrible situation um, uh, that, that, that you know, these women were saying all these things and he believed it at the beginning. Then he was persuaded by his friends to reject that knowledge and to invert it. So uh, instead of accepting that many, many women have been raped by their fathers, he invented the incest theory, which said that girls were sexually attracted to their fathers, but because they couldn't accept this, they invented the notion that their father had sexually abused them. This became the standard understanding emanating from psychoanalysis and governing the attitude of psychiatry to incest right up to the birth of the women's liberation movement. So the women's liberation movement had to 
to fight all of that burying of this form of violence against women. And in the 1970s, feminist organized speak outs on each kind of men's violence um, against women one by one and to show the full spectrum. Um, and the first speak outs were against rape, which was denounced at the outset of the movement. So the first writing on rape that was published in the mainstream world, and there may be others, but the one I know about is Susan Griffin's Rape, the All-American Crime, which was in Ramparts magazine in 71. Then there were more and more speak outs on the different kinds of violence against women to bring them to publish consciousness and enable women to be able to speak about them. So eventually this was, by the late 1970s, this was very much focusing on um, the sexual violence against children. Now the first significant book on the topic, can we have a slide nine, Joe? Next one, yeah. I just want to give you a, a little introduction to some of the books. There were many in these 10 years and give an idea of the, the scope of the feminist analysis out of which this book comes. The first sort of significant one was Louise Armstrong's wonderful book, Kiss Daddy Goodnight, and which is subbed out a, a speak out on incest, which shows what women were doing and has got accounts of women's um, incestuous experience or rape by their fathers. Um, and the next one was Florence Rush's The Best Kept Secret. The Best Kept Secret, she's talking there about Freud's covering up of incest. And she's, um, and it's a really important book for understanding how that happened. Um, Louise de Salvo also uh, uh, mentions the work of Judith Herman, whose book Father Daughter Incest was published in 1981. At the beginning of the book, Louise talks about some of this important work. So you can see where her analysis is coming from. And I also want to mention the last one here, which is the, another one by Louise Armstrong, 1994, Rocking the Cradle of Sexual Politics. What happened when women said incest? What Louise Armstrong says is, in the period after her book came out in 1978, which was the first big one, um, what happened was, I mean, she hoped, and I think feminists generally hoped, that men's rape of their daughters and other children uh, in the home would be uh, stopped. It would be brought to an end. There would be campaigns against it, the state, the police, something would be done about it. Of course, nothing was done about it. It's still huge. What did happen, Louise Armstrong says, is that a therapy industry was created, mainly of women therapists, who called themselves feminists, of course, and saw themselves as doing a very good job, which was healing the women who had been raped by their fathers and fitting them back into the fabric of male domination in a way in which they could survive. She thought this was a disaster because bringing up the issue of incest should have made a difference and it really, really didn't make a difference. So um, I think, I think we're uh, thinking about now, if we think about what's happening in the landscape of feminism right now, there's very little about incest, not much out there. It's not, it's not a big issue. It's mainly therapized. It's mainly therapeutic approaches that you see. That's really what's going on rather than political approaches. I do think Louise de Salvo's book is a, one, a wonderfully political book on the other hand. Um, can we have the next slide? Okay, so this is, um, on the first page of the book. And this is part of the bombshell that uh, Luisa Salvo unleashes upon us, which is talking about the whole family background of um, Virginia Woolf. She says, uh, Virginia Woolf was raised in a household in which incest, sexual violence, and abusive behavior were a common rather than a singular or rare occurrence. A family in which there is evidence that virtually all were involved in either incest or violence or both. A family in which each parent had lived through childhood trauma themselves. So in the family, can we take that one down now, please, Joe? In the family, there were four sisters who were uh, sexually abused and the four sisters were Laura, Stella, Vanessa, and Virginia. Now, uh, Luisa Salvo says that 
Um, this was, she thinks that this was not an uncommon family, that many Victorian families, and of course it was never spoken of, um, were in, engaging in this kind of behavior. We certainly know that in many households, of course, the, the sons were uh, sexually using young teenage maids who would then get thrown out of the household and so on. So it is likely that they were also uh, using their daughter, uh, daughters, sisters and so on in, in similar ways. So I'm just going to um, look at who's, uh, who these sisters were and talk about what was happening to them before uh, Leanne Lier goes on to talk about Virginia in particular. Now, the, the, the first sister to talk about is Laura, and she was uh, Virginia's father, Leslie's daughter from a first marriage. And as Louise Salvo explains, it was very difficult for, for children. I mean, mothers often died in childbirth and so on. And it was difficult for children from previous marriages to fit themselves into new families. And often they were the objects of abuse. So she was the daughter from a previous marriage. Um, Stella was the daughter of Virginia's mother, Julia's first marriage. And then there were two brothers as well from that marriage who went on to sexually abuse Virginia. Then there were two more brothers from the marriage of Virginia's mother and father. So there were eight children in the household you know, and the parents paid, ex paid extremely little attention to what was going on in this mess of relationships. Laura um, was seen from very early in her childhood as evil and deliberately intransigent. So for instance, she's seen as refusing to read properly. Apparently she had dreadful fits and she did howls and she refused to accept punishment. This was a particularly terrible thing that she did. She refused to accept because Victorian children were supposed to be pleased with being punished. That was very good for them. Now, at the behavior, as uh, De Salvo said, suggests, um, does suggest that the child had probably been abused herself. Uh, because the behavior she engaged in as a small child um, were very suggestive of this. She was first of all put away in a different part of the house. Um, and then in um, 1887, when she was 21, she was sent to an asylum in York um, and put away entirely as uh, uh, Victorian parents and well up into the 20th century tended to do with their difficult children, difficult wives and so on. In then, um, it, she's, uh, De Salvo says that the symptoms which, for which Laura was punished and put away resemble those common among girls who've suffered the trauma of sexual violence. Uh, in the household, boys were favored and of the, course they received an education which the girls did not. Now let's look at another sister. So the, uh, there's another sister, Stella Duckworth, and she was one of another of Virginia's half sisters from her mother's first marriage. Uh, she was harshly treated by her mother, especially after her father died and her mother was grief stricken. Um, and this uh, daughter Stella was abused in the, in the family by a man called J.K. Stephen, who was her stepfather's uh, brother. Uh, this man apparently had wild and terrible rages and pursued Stella in particular in a very violent, sexually violent way, all in the household. Nothing, of course, was done about this and it was all covered up. Um, she, she's, um, Virginia Woolf um, describes um, JK as saying he would burst into the nursery and spear the bread on his sword stick which is a bit of a problem, a bit of a problem, men rushing around using sword sticks anyway in households, as obviously they did at that time. So he had states of mania and he would violently and sexually pursue poor Stella. Virginia's parents uh, refused to see there was a problem. And when Virginia's mother died, Stella was expected to take Stella's place for the father. So this was another whole chapter of sexual abuse in her life. And Virginia would apparently come into rooms and find her father and poor Stella locked in embraces. Now to get away, not because she had any interest in him, 
Stella married a man called Jack Hills, who is said to have been a violent lover, and he injured her on her honeymoon. And the injury is seen to have caused peritonitis, which killed um, Stella a few months later. And when Stella died, she was pregnant. So, uh, and Virginia, she had been a sort of substitute mother for, to Virginia. So Virginia had another loss. She lost her own mother, then she lost her substitute mother and Stella. I mean, it's so terrible, really. I mean, reading the book and hearing what happened to all of them is, is really a horrendous experience. Presumably a woman was ex expected at that time, if she married, to accept terrible sexual violence from the man she was married to that could damage her unto death. And that was something that was just accepted. Now, the, the, the other sister, of course, was Vanessa. And Vanessa was the full sister of Virginia. Now, um, Virginia's half-brother, George, sexually assaulted Vanessa, as well as Virginia. Uh, for seven years from, um, and then from se for seven years from the time that she was 18 to the time that she was 25, he apparently used her as a companion in public and sexually assaulted her in public. So with everybody watching what was going on, he behaved her as if she was simply, towards her as if she was simply his sexual property. Now, the, the sisters were, and, and Louise de Salvo's book says very, very little about this, but the sisters were um, sexually involved with each other. She says the sisters were still sexually involved with one another as late as 1905 when Virginia was 23, and I thought I missed it, the discussion of their sexual relationship with each other. But So it is rather passed over in the book. Um, the, Vanessa wrote during an absence how Virginia would probably be pining for a real petting when she arrives. Perhaps if you have been good, you may get it. So that in itself is an interesting detail of what was going on in the household. And we have these details for the life of Virginia, which just are quite extraordinary compared with what we know about other writers. There's so much written down and available to us. So uh, there is, uh, there's a great deal more to say about the physical, the sexual and emotional violence inflicted on these children in what was to our eyes a severely dysfunctional household. But what De Salvo says is that this should be seen as an ordinary Victorian household. I'm not gonna cover all of this here, uh, but there's an enormous amount of very interesting detail, which I think you will enjoy reading about. So what I'm going to do now is hand over to Lierre to talk about what happened to Virginia in particular. Uh, well, my next slides are actually about the book, about To the Lighthouse. Um, though, okay. if you want me to talk more about Virginia, I can. Oh, I um, thought you were going to say a bit more about what happened to her, but no. I don't have that prepared, but I mean, I did read the book, so I can if we can just sort of wing it if we want because well <laughs> okay. it was, I mean it's just horrible like this book is I read it when it first came out but I didn't it was a long time ago so I reread it over the week and I honestly had nightmares about it last night like that's how bad this stuff was um you just get this sense of like no matter where these girls turned it just got worse and worse for them it, it was just horrendous like every single man who had access to them was either emotionally or physically abused to them and their mother was completely checked out. She clearly was mentally ill as well, very depressed, who could blame her? Um, you know, she had clearly been abused as well in her household of origin and she just wasn't there and then she died. So then there was nobody for them to depend on as, um, you know, any kind of female protection from any of this. So you just get this sense of like, it's just the walls just keep closing in on these poor girls. Um, and then hearing about what happened to poor Laura, the first one, who ends up just locked away in the top of the house and then sent off to this institution is just chilling, you know, because she has these fits of rage and who could blame her. Um, so then it just keeps going. Like each of these girls just has a horrible story. So then the one Stella, poor Stella, who's, 
probably violently raped by this horrible brother, you know, the brother of the, the, of the husband, he, you know, he's just, he's over the house all the time. And there's just story after story of him chasing this poor girl around the house and trying to grab her. And I assume rape her. Um, and so then she marries this, this violent man to get away. And the, so peritonitis, you only get that in two ways. And one is you get it if you have um, liver disease or kidney disease. And so it's secondary to that. And she clearly didn't have liver disease. And the other way you get it is if one of your organs um, essentially ruptures. Mm -hmm. And that only happens because of a, a violent impact. So on her honeymoon, she was either punched or kicked in the abdomen by this horrible man. And then like three months later, she's dead from the infection. They didn't have antibiotics. So there was nothing to save her. Um, and the, it's just, it's so horrifying. So then, then you get to Vanessa in Virginia and there's all these horrible stories about, and she's, Virginia was six years old when she was first molested by the, by George, the mm -hmm. half brother. Um, and there's, she has, she did write about it. And she also told a lot of people, not at the time, but when she was an adult, like she told everybody in their social circle what had happened. Um, she was really a trailblazer in that way. Like, yeah. I doubt anybody else was talking about it, but she seemed um, very determined to get the truth out there about what had happened to her. No, you absolutely weren't supposed to talk about anything yeah. of that kind at that time. So it was extraordinary that she not only talked about it, she wrote it down in many yeah. places. Quite extraordinary. She wrote it in letters. She told all her female friends. She told everybody in their extended social circle um, so that they would know what a horrible man he was. And some of them, you know, did have some solidarity with her and was and just decided that they also wouldn't speak to him. Um, so there was like a 20 year gap where she didn't have to see him, um, which I think I'm sure was a positive thing for her. Um, and then, um, yeah, but it went on for years. It went on for like a decade where he would molest her. And I don't know whether it was out and out rape or not. It, it, that is not clear to me, but certainly it was sexual abuse. So, and then the same thing happened to Vanessa to her older sister, but by these two, these two men. Um, so that was really, it was just horrible. And she's very upfront, like with Leonard, her husband, where there's letters and things where she says, it's because of what happened to me when I was a child, I think, but I, I don't know, but I, I, think, I think this is why, I don't want anything to do with you. Um, I just, I have no <laughs> sensation of desire for any male. I, I don't want anything to do with this. Um, and it did lead her to have incredible insight into patriarchy. I mean, for all the horrors that she endured, she then was able to see it everywhere. I mean, that's the gift of, you know, having been through such a tremendously awful experience is, you know, then you have your survivor mission. And so she was able to see patriarchy across all the institutions. And that's what Three Guineas is about. Um, and so she left us this incredible legacy of, um, you know, her bravery and then also her clarity about, about male power, about male sexual supremacy um, that really was not matched for, she was well ahead, 50 years ahead of her time because yeah. she did this all her own. She didn't really have the kinds of things that some of us had in the seventies and the eighties. You know, when we were coming into radical feminism, there was radical feminism, like it got invented. And then there was this huge breaking of the silence. Um, so we had language to describe what had happened to us. Virginia was on her own, like trying to figure this out. And she did an, an extraordinary job of it, of trying to tell people what had happened. And she was well aware that this was probably happening everywhere. And she tried to join different campaigns that were stopping the, the sexual abuse of children. Um, and then there's a part in the book that's incredibly depressing because she stumbles into Freud. And um, DeSalvo really thinks that this was one of the reasons she committed suicide. Yes. Um, so a bunch of things are happening at the time. One is that the Nazis are gaining power across Europe and the bombing has started um, in London. And Leonard is Jewish and they're terrified that the Nazis are gonna take over and they have a suicide pact that if actually, if the Germans invade, that they're gonna both kill, kill themselves. And she's walking around with poison in her pocket for months waiting for this to happen because they're so scared. And I mean, that's quite real. That's not, they would have been sent to concentration camps and they both know <laughs> it and they, they're, they're gonna die rather than do that. So that, I don't think that that really comes across. I mean, you hear about Virginia Woolf and the fact that she committed suicide and maybe she was bipolar and she had this terrible depression. Like nobody ever situates this in the, con the historical context of they're about to be invaded by like the worst regime that's ever existed. And th their death is absolutely predictable. Like there's not gonna be anywhere for them to go. There's no way to escape. And so they have a suicide pact. Like that's just, 
that was absolutely the truth of it. And so, you know, the bombings began, they're like, how many days do we have left? And they had a date picked even like, okay, well, we think this is the date that they're probably going to invade. And on that day, we will kill ourselves. So it's part of it. Then that's very real. And then the next part of it was that she was starting to read Freud and it completely messed with her head. Whereas before she was quite solid about what had happened to her. She reads these theories about, oh, girls make this stuff up because they have a, you know, an incestuous love for their fathers that can never be requited. Um, and so therefore, you know, they just make up these fantasies. And you can see in her diary that she's very, very confused now about the truth of the abuse that happened to her. Um, and so she spirals down into this terrible depression because suddenly she's, it, before she was very clear about what had happened to her, but after reading Freud, she does, she's not really sure anymore. Like it's really, really messed with her mind. Um, and very soon after that, she commits suicide. So I think that that absolutely played a role. And I, it's just evil. Like what Freud did is absolutely, it's cowardice and it's evil. He yes. absolutely, and for the first few years- everybody should know that story. And yeah. loads of people still do not know what Freud yeah. did. He believed women for the first few years. And then, you know, all of the middle-class men of Vienna were horrified and said, this can't be true. You can't talk about it. Um, we're not gonna have it. It's fine if you're talking about prostituted women who may have had these terrible experiences, but you're talking about the middle-class daughters of the intelligentsia and we won't have it, you can't say it. And so he retracted it all and made up this bizarre theory, which is with us still. And so, the, 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 his best friend, whose name is escaping me at the moment, who mainly persuaded him that he had to drop the theory, it was later discovered had been sexually abusing his son. His son said that he was being sexually abused. And that man too, um, asked for Freud's help at one point because he made a bit of a mistake in a nose operation. These men carried out nose before, operations yeah. if they found that women masturbated to stop them masturbating. So the woman was having a nose bone removed to stop her masturbating in this operation and he had left something like half a meter of gauze in there and it was a bit of a problem and he needed Freud to come across and help him as to what to do. I mean, this is the status of these men who constructed these terrible myths about women and imprisoned women in this awful structures of psychoanalysis and therapy and so on. But can I, I just say also about the DeSalvo book, what it also gives us, and I think why it's so shocking, it is such a contrast with the, the picture of Victorian England and Edwardian England that we've been given in all of the novels and you know in Howard's End and in the upstairs downstairs programs on television there's absolutely nothing in any of this about sexual abuse of women and children and in fact it's supposed to be all about being terribly polite the women have to go to um, a different they have to be in a different room so the men can go to the withdrawing room so they can talk about pornography somewhere different and there's all this supposed chivalry the whole picture that we have received is totally 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 shot apart by this book and we by hearing, reading what happened to one particular um, family. I mean, it's extraordinary how different the picture actually is from what we are encouraged to understand the Victorian and Edwardian era was. But the other big difference, of course, and one thing that makes what Virginia was prepared to speak about so extraordinary compared um, with anyone else, is that in at the time of the women's liberation movement, we had choices. We could work, you know, from the from the late uh, 19th century onwards, there was beginning to be work for, for respectable middle class women. They could start, they could be teachers, they could be typewriters, as it was called, meaning using typewriters and being what we would then call typists. So there were alternatives at the beginning and end of the 19th century, it was even becoming possible for young uh, middle class women to go up to London and live with each other in digs, in, in flats, in houses and so on. But at the time when all of this was happening to Virginia Woolf, there was no exit. There was no exit except as, in the case of Stella, marrying a violent man to escape other violent men. That was the only possibility. So that makes it so extraordinary that she was, as you say, prepared to talk about all of this uh, when nobody else was. So to lift the lid on the sewer that was Victorian Edwardian Society for Women and Girls. 
the thing it reminds me of is Emmeline Pankhurst because after her husband died, she went to work in the census office and her job was to register the births. So every day women came in with new babies and you know she would write down the name of the mother and the father and the baby and the date and all that um, to, for the government records. And there's this you know quote from her where she talks about how day after day, these young girls, 14, 15 years old will come in and she'd start to record you know, what her, you know, her job, just start writing it down. And the, she would get to the question and who's the father of the baby and the girls would just start crying because over and over again, the, the father of the baby was some male relative and this child was born from rape. And she felt so deeply and keenly the horror of this, that, you know, th this was happening on such a mass scale. And all she could think to do was, well, we'll start by getting women the vote. And maybe you know that can be a way in to try to change something bigger like the most radical of the suffragists understood what they were up against um there was some knowledge amongst yes. them about the horrors of of what women's lives were really like and like you say there was no exit so a lot of reading a lot of the disavow book just reminded me of emmeline pankhurst and you know what she saw day after day and that it was just the horrors of what women are forced to endure and young girls you know and then what, what happens to them? Now they've got a baby out of wedlock and they feel, you know, they've got no, they're just gonna end up in the sex trade. Like there's there's no other option for them except to end up on the street. So, you know, they're quote ruined. So um, it's just this, just that sense of claustrophobia. Like how, how did women ever get through this? You know, Incredible. God, we are so lucky. That's like the other thing I've been thinking all week is uh, whatever happened to me, I was able to get out, you know, like, I own a house. I have a bank account. Like I control my own life. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have to marry a man to escape. It's just things were so bad. And it, but then you know, back to Louise Armstrong's point is like this has to go back to being a political movement to stop this. It was never enough to just say, all right, well, we'll have some first aid stations now and try to make women feel better after the fact. Like whatever happened to all of that, that rage to try to change it for for girls and women because it's all still going on and it's seen as fine because there is a therapy industry to deal with it yeah I mean, it just it's horrendous yeah that's it's a great line in that armstrong book that i never forgot where she said yeah we broke the silence but our goal was never to start a conversation and i was like thank you <laughs> our goal was to start a political movement so anyway that's it's a really the DeSalvo book is amazing and i really it's gruesome, but it's one of those things you really, you should read. Everybody should read this book. I don't think it ever got the level of um, the readership that it should have gotten. And it will enrage you too, because there's these moments near the beginning where she goes through all the other biographers of Wolf and the way that they either dismiss it. So this never happened to her, she's lying. Or, you know, they, they try to excuse it by saying things like, well, you know, he was such a handsome young man. Of course, Virginia's heart must have thrilled that he was paying attention to her, like shit like this. And it's like after like two pages of this, you're like back to that level of rage where you could just kill somebody. You know, like, ah, how can these people read Virginia's own writings about this and come away with this just horrendous level of misogyny? It's, un it's just unbelievable. But all of her biographers, except DeSalvo, they all did it. Even mm -hmm. the ones that were better still did this kind of rewrite of, you know, what this Even the women, is. even the ones that were vaguely yeah. feminist. Yeah. I don't get it. I don't understand why. Why do you want to excuse this? Why? Why would you pretend that she somehow enjoyed this or, you know, wasn't particularly opposed to it or something? Like, I don't understand what that, I don't understand that impulse. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. I never will. Mm -hmm. So anyway um that's so that's anyway, we should we should probably go on to the book itself yeah to so let's have list. another slide joe the next one which i guess is slide 15. yeah okay um so louisa salvo argues very persuasively in her book that um, Virginia's writings were based to a very large extent upon her experience of that horrendous family. Um, and this book, To the Lighthouse, 
Uh, it was actually the book that I studied for A-level when I was 17, 18 years old in school. I loved it then. I have always loved it. And I love it particularly because um, what I think it shows us is uh, very clearly the horrendous nature of masculinity and what was expected for women in femininity. So it, it, it sh shows that in an extraordinary degree. So the story is that this family um, with eight children, as there were eight children in Virginia's family, would go to a holiday house in the summer holidays where they'd stay for three months and they would have a, a various, mainly men, uh, because Rab Mr. Ramsey was a philosopher, so other philosophy uh, men, other philosophers would come and stay, sometimes a couple of women, but the women were very insignificant. Um, and in the to, to the lighthouses on the Isle of Skye, which is actually extremely unlikely, I think, because the weather would have been absolutely terrible. In fact, the Wolf family house uh, was in um, Cornwall, so it was actually quite pleasant weather. So if we just look at the way she's um, talking about the, the two main um, characters, the, the mother and the father here, uh, I love this description by um, the son. This is a, the description by the son James of um, the philosophy of his father, because his father just strode about the estate and thought great thoughts all the time. He was tremendously revered, seen as absolutely marvellous. Of course, he never lifted a finger to bother about anybody else or to bother about what was going on because he was a great thinker. And this is what the son says. Uh, what Mr. Ramsey does is think of a kitchen table when you're not there. So this was a time of completely useless, ridiculous, absurd masculine philosophy where they're just, you know, um, uh, lost in um, things that have no importance or significance to anybody at all, but getting absolutely revered for it. So you know that kind of philosophy. I'm sure it will be uh, familiar to you. Um, but it was when I was young and when I was reading this novel for the first time there was a particular um, bit that I remember and it is this next bit that is still James supposedly looking at what's going on and describing uh, what happens when Mrs. Ramsey, Mrs. Ramsey is an earth mother figure, you know, all of my life, whenever I've needed to describe an earth mother figure, I would call her a Mrs. Ramsey, and I think probably many others have as well. So she um, has no ambitions of her own, she totally worships her husband, completely neglects her children, and, and so on and so on, and she's, her job is to keep every, everybody going well in the house. So this is, this is the son's description of how she gears herself up to greet her husband. She seemed at once to, to pour erect into the air a, a rain of energy, a column of spray looking at the same time animated and alive as if all her energies were being fused into force, burning and illuminating. And into this delicious fecundity, this fountain and spray of life, the fatal sterility of the male plunged itself like a beak of brass, barren and bare. And it's that last phrase that I've remembered all my life. It's always been in my mind about what a, what a man and masculinity is. The fatal sterility of the male plunged itself like a beak of brass, barren and bare. And I'm sure she had had that fatal sterility, what she also calls the arid scimitar of the male, plunged into her over and over again when she had been sexually abused. So it's, 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 um, it's a wonderful um, description, I think. Um, could we find, could we have the um, next one? Um, this is uh, Mrs. Ramsey again, seen by James. James felt all her strength flaring up to be drunk and quenched by the beak of brass, the arid scimitar of the male. That's just marvellous. Smoked mercilessly again and again, demanding sympathy. And this is the state she was left in, boasting of her capacity to surround and protect. There was scarcely a shell of herself left for her to know herself by. All was so lavish and spent, and James, as he stood stiff between her knees, felt her rise in a rosy flowered fruit tree. I always remembered that phrase too. Laid with leaves and dancing boughs, into which 
the beak of brass, the arid symmetry of his father, the egotistical man plunged again and again, demanding sympathy. I just think they're extraordinary quotes. Um, and what Mrs. Ramsey does, of course, in this, um, in the novel, is what's now called emotional labor, or what we would see as emotional labor, that hugely important labor of women to keep everything going, to keep everybody um, getting along with each other, to service the man emotionally so that he can do all his thinking about tables and whether they're there when you're not there and so on. Could we have the next slide, Jean? Now, um, something else that I find really interesting about the book is where it's right, uh, the writing about servants. Um, because, of course, uh, Virginia Woolf, in theory, is more sympathetic to servants than others because there's a bit of a socialist in her. But generally, socialists, uh, generally, servants are never mentioned in novels. She does mention them, she gives them names. And she mentions what's going on with them and what Mrs. Ramsey says to them and so on, which is actually quite unusual because in novels of this time, there's just a total ignoring of the servants. They don't exist. The, there's a class system, which is servants, non-servants, which is just, um, just uh, governs everything. Um, I'm particularly interested in it because my... Um, my grandmother was in service, my auntie was a chambermaid and so on. So I come from this background. I would never have been one of those discussing ideas or writing books or doing anything at this time. I would have been a servant like the servants in this novel. So I look for my myself, so, you know, from my ancestors in these novels. I find that interesting. And there's just this one line of the Swiss girl sobbing for her father who was dying of cancer in a valley of the Grison. So this is a servant girl who was in the house doing some servant task. She, she couldn't be with her father dying of cancer because she had to be somewhere else earning a bit of money. And, and it's just such a terribly, terribly sad line. And the, but at least Virginia Woolf no, notices, and she puts that line in. Normally it would not be there. This other class of persons uh, would never be mentioned and they would never exist. And this is an interesting uh, quote from um, Mr. Ramsey, who's thinking of the time before he married. He had worked 10 hours at a stretch. An old woman just popped her head in now and again and saw to the fire, lovely. And it's lovely that Virginia writes that because it just shows, you know, how, how horrendous the whole system was. And these great men would sit there and do their poetry and do their philosophy and barely notice that there were women servicing everything and allowing them to continue. But she did, Virginia did, and she's popped that lovely line in there. Can we have the next slide? There is a book from 2008 called Mrs. Wolf and the Servants by Alison Light. Absolutely fascinating. The whole book is about all of her interactions with servants, what she said about them, what she did with them, and so on. And that really shows you the whole other world, the whole nether world that underlay all of this. OK, I'll stop there now. Over to you. OK, next slide. So, um... Uh, gosh, is did I miss a slide? Can you go back one? Because there's another quote I wanted to do, and I thought I had it in here. Nope, I somehow missed it. All right, well, go on. That's okay. We'll just skip it. Um, so this is um, Mrs. Ramsey, the mom, um, and the man that they're talking about is this guy, uh, Charles Tansley. So um, and she's defending him. So he's been invited to stay with the family. And the girls especially don't like him. But Mrs. Ramsey's job in order to be a quote, good woman is to properly socialize these girls to constantly attend to the male ego. So when the girls complain about this guy, Charles, she gives them this dressing down, um, but you will see that there is rebellion in the ranks. So this is the quote, she meaning Mrs. Ramsey, the mother had the whole of the other sex so the male sex under her protection for reasons she could not explain for their chivalry and valor for the fact that they negotiated treaties, ruled India, controlled finance, finally for an attitude towards herself, which no woman could fail to feel or find agreeable, something trustful, childlike, reverential, which an old woman could take from a young man without loss of dignity and woe betide the girl, pray heaven it was none of her daughters who did not feel the worth of it and all that it implied to the marrow of her bones, she turned with severity upon Nancy. Okay, so this is what's called benign patriarchy. Uh, if you're a good woman, if you nurture men and children, 
if you sac sacrifice yourself constantly to their needs, the bargain is you get, quote unquote, reverence, uh, you get respect. And this is the bargain that the right, especially the religious right, and I mean of every religion, uh, this is what they offer women. And Andrea Dworkin laid this out so eloquently in her book, Right Wing Women. But make no mistake, the left demands the same of women, the exact same. And that's frankly at the heart of the success of the women identity men's movement. Uh, men of the left demanding that women mother all the men, especially the suffering super special men, demanding that women sacrifice everything and only then will men grant us respect and ultimately protection from other men's violence. It's the same bargain from the right and from the left. Okay, next, next slide. So this is the mother still. She was now formidable to behold and it was only in silence looking upon their plates after she had spoken so severely about Charles Tansley that her daughters, Prue Nancy Rose, could sport with infidel ideas which they had brewed for themselves of a different life from hers. In Paris, perhaps a wilder life, not always taking care of some man or other for there was in all their minds a mute questioning of defense and chivalry, of the Bank of England and the Indian Empire, of ringed fingers and lace, though to them all there was something in this of the essence of beauty, which called out the manliness in their girlish hearts and made them, as they sat at table beneath their mother's eyes, honor her strange severity, her extreme courtesy, like a queen's raising from the mud to wash a beggar's dirty foot when she admonished them so severely about that wretched atheist who had chased them or speaking accurately, been invited to stay with them in the Isle of Skye. So the girls are supposed to learn that women are in their glory when they defend men and female self-sacrifice. They still have infidel hearts, but after being reprimanded to accept their place, we have the words only in the silence and mute questioning of chivalry and male dominance. So I cut a bit out um, about Charles Tansley, but he's standing with Mr. Ramsley at the window and he enjoys backing him up by also saying there won't be a trip to the lighthouse. So the book opens with the youngest son, James, wondering about, can they go to the lighthouse tomorrow? And Mr. Ramsey immediately has to shoot him down and say, no, we're not gonna be able to go because it's raining, it's gonna rain tomorrow. Um, and He's such a smug prick about it that the son absolutely despises him, just despises him. Um, and so there's, this was the quote that I wanted to read. Um, the kid actually thinks, had there been an ax handy or a poker, any weapon that would have gashed a hole in his father's breast and killed him then and there, James would have seized it. Such were the extremes of emotion that Mr. Ramsey excited in his children's breasts by his mere presence. Standing as now, lean as a knife, narrow as the blade of one, grinning sarcastically, not only with the pleasure of disillusioning his son and casting ridicule upon his wife, who was 10,000 times better in every way than he was, James thought, but also with some secret conceit at his own accuracy of judgment. So the six-year-old sees what a horrible man the father is. Um, so the, the father is like, no, we can't go. It's, it's going to be terrible weather. Um, and then this Charles Tansley guy, he backs him up. So they're both standing at the window, you know, sort of making fun of the children and the wife and making them all feel terrible. Um, and, Miss, and then Mrs. Ramsey in her mind recalls that Andrew, one of the other sons has said about Charles that he's quote, a sarcastic brute. Um, but what Charles enjoys most is walking up and down with Mr. Ramsey and essentially gossiping about other important men and who's great at this or that in philosophy and mathematics and they're having their bro fest and the women and the children are there as props to manage the men's emotions and make them feel better. So can I have the next slide? But it was not that they minded, the children said. It was not his face, it was not his manners, it was him, the meaning Charles. It was his point of view. When they talked about something interesting, people, music, history, anything, even said it was a fine evening, so why not sit out of doors? Then what they complained of about Charles Tansley was, th was that until he had turned the whole thing around and made it somehow reflect himself and disparage them, he was not satisfied. And he would go to picture galleries, they said. And he would ask one, did one like his tie? God knows, said, Run, said Rose, one did not. So I have hope for Rose. Um, but here is yet another man with an outsized ego 
who has to make everything about himself and demand that everyone, the women and the children, pay attention to him while he is insulting them. And the children hate him for it, the girls especially, but they're reprimanded for hating him. Okay, next slide. And finally, no discussion of To the Lighthouse would be complete without mentioning the scene with Lily Briscoe and the Boots. Um, Lily is another of the guests of the Ramses. She's unmarried. She wants an independent and creative life as a painter. And this scene happens in the third, third section of the book when the remaining family and friends gather on the Isle of Skye. So in the third part of the book, it's 10 years later, Mrs. Ramsey has died and also two of the children are now dead. So a lot has happened in the 10 years. So they're meeting again on the Isle of Skye. So she's still trying to trying to be a painter. So this that sort of sets the scene. She set her clean canvas firmly upon the easel as a barrier, uh, frail, but she hopes sufficiently substantial to ward off Mr. Ramsey and his exacting it. She did her best to look when his back was turned at her picture, that line there, that mass there, but it was out of the question. Let him be 50 feet away. Let him not even speak to you. Let him not even see you. He permeated, he prevailed, he imposed himself, he changed everything. She could not see the color, she could not see the lines. Even with his back turned to her, she could only think, but he'll be down on me in a moment, demanding. Something she felt she could not give him. She rejected one brush, she chose another. When would those children come? When would they all be off, she fidgeted. That man, she thought, her anger rising in her, never gave, that man took. She, on the other hand, would be forced to give. Mrs. Ramsey had given, giving, 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 she had died and had left all this. So this goes on for six pages where Mr. Ramsey demands that Lily Briscoe pay attention to him, that she give him some sympathy, that she give him something. Um, and she keeps trying to put him off and she simply can't. So uh, next, next slide. So he's throwing out gambit after gambit, demanding her sympathy. She just can't make herself submit to it. And then uh, finally notices that his boots are untied. So you shan't touch your canvas, he seemed to say, bearing down on her till you've given me what I want of you. Here he was close upon her again, greedy, distraught. Well, thought Lily in despair, let her right hand fall at her side. It would be simpler then to have it over. Surely she could imitate from recollection the glow, the rhapsody, the self-surrender she had seen on so many women's faces, on Mrs. Ramsey's, for instance, when on some occasion like this, they, they blazed up. She could remember that look on Mrs. Ramsey's face into a rapture of sympathy, of delight in the reward they had, which though the reason of it escaped her, evidently conferred on them the most su supreme bliss of which human nature was capable. Okay, next slide. And finally, the boots. So this goes on and on and on, where he keeps bringing up all these things, and like he's trying to trigger this this flood of sympathy and energy from her, and she just can't do it. And then finally, uh, he he realizes that his boots are untied, and so she she finds a way out, and she says, "What beautiful boots!" So this is like after him, you know. Oh, my wife has died. Oh, poor me. Pity me. Everything's terrible, and she just can't give him any sympathy because he's demanding it. He's trying to make her submit and she won't do it. And so finally the boots. What beautiful boots, boots, he exclaimed. She was ashamed of herself. To praise his boots when he had asked her to solace his soul, when he had shown her his bleeding hands, his lacerated heart and asked her to pity them, then to say cheerfully, ah, oh, but what beautiful boots you wear, deserves she knew. And she looked up expecting to get it in one of his sudden roars of ill temper, complete annihilation. Instead, Mr. Ramsey smiled. His pall, his draperies, his infirmities fell from him. Ah, yes, he said, holding his foot up for her to look at. They were first-rate boots. There was only one man in England who could make boots like that. So he goes on for like five minutes about how wonderful these boots are because he's finally gotten what he wants from her, which is just like this tiny little bit of acknowledgement. And so he's just an absolute fool. He just can't stop talking about, they're the best boots in England. They're the best boots have ever been invented. Um, because he's managed to wring a compliment from her. So he waxes eloquent for five minutes. Um, it's utterly pathetic. And every woman alive has had this experience, the male ego feeding on coerced female attention. And this whole scene again is about six pages long and it's utterly brilliant. It's enraging and hysterically funny and cuts to the heart of power relations between men and women. So 
Please read, Virginia Woolf. We did it. It's exactly three o'clock. We managed it. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thanks everybody. I think that's it, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, we did it. We did that's a good it. job. It's a great book. DeSalvo is great. And then all read of it. Read it. Read, just read, just read all of it. Awesome. Just read it. <laughs>